Good afternoon and warm welcome to the Institute for Advanced Study. This is the second event of the lecture series Scholarly Correspondences among Orientalists during the early and late modern period as a historical source. One aspect that is important to us is to look at the possibilities digital scholarship tools can open up to explore the material at hand. And this is why the series is co-hosted by NES and Digital Scholarship here at IAS. And with this, I pass the word to my colleague, Maria mercedes Tuya from our IT department, who is in charge of digital scholarship here at the IAS. You're muted, Maria. Maria, you're muted. So much for technology. Thank you very <laughs> much for that one. Well, anyway, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, we're very glad that you could join us. Uh, let me just add some housekeeping rules at this point. Uh, we ask you that you keep your microphones muted to avoid any um, distractions to our speakers. Uh, we will be using the chat for questions and comments. Please feel free to add them during the the talk or, or at the end of it. Um, and at that point, Sabine will be handling the reading of the questions. Okay, and now I'm very happy to introduce today's speakers, Ukaya Reichling and Kotos Abdelhafez, who join us today from the Netherlands and from Belgium. Kotos Abdelhafez and Ukaya Reichling, both are early stage researchers of the European Marie Sklodowska Curie ITN project called MIDA, an acronym for Mediating Islam in the Digital Age. Central to the MIDA research program stands the premise that technological <clears throat> innovations and digitalization have a tremendous impact on Islam, Muslim lives, and the study of the Middle East. Within the broader uh, uh, MIDA framework, Kotas Abdelhafiz works on a subproject titled Arab Orientalist Encounters in the Colonial Age. With the aid of digital tools, he researches the complex networks of oriental list scholars in Europe, as well as Muslim intellectuals in the Middle East, to uncover their interconnectedness and scholarly cooperation. Kotos has a background in anthropology and social sciences, and he is currently working uh, as a PhD candidate at uh, Leuven. Ukai Reichling, on the other hand, investigates how the advent of photography, phonography, and film reshaped the Dutch perception of Mecca in the late colonial period. Her research addresses how, in the context of the Hajj, the use of technology opened up new avenues for scholars of Islam. Rukaya has a background in modern languages and cultural anthropology, and she's affiliated to the University of Amsterdam. And now I pass to Rukaya or Kotos. I don't know who among you wants to start, so the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the nice introduction. We are very happy and honored to be here today to speak about our own project, um, which is called Culture Between European Orientalism and the Arab Nahda, Digitally Mapping a Far-Reaching Network. So both of us have a background, as you just heard, in anthropology, and that's why we think um, that a positionality in terms of who we are as researchers is really important um, and how it brought us together. Maybe, uh, can, you, can you forward, go to the next slide? Yes. So um, as was already uh, just mentioned by Professor Sabine Schmidtke, is we are in this network of 15 different uh, researchers uh, who do research on this one, different perspective, uh, perspectives on uh, digital humanities and Islam and how new technologies have shaped and reshaped um, Islam actually in the past and also uh, at the moment, Kutus and me are three, uh, two out of three uh, from our team who work on, uh, histor on a historical topic. My own topic, the following slide, please, is uh, on photography, motion picture, and phonography, as already mentioned. And I look into these, like how these, these um, very important inventions of the 19th century were used by the Dutch in the late colonial period to portray Mecca. So to get an image of Mecca, of the pilgrims from Indonesia to Mecca. Um, yes. And this actually brings us to the intersection but Kotos will first speak very shortly about his own project and perspective. Uh, well, uh, to be honest, I think, uh... 
Athena just uh, did that perfectly that I don't need to reintroduce myself in a sense. Uh, because in, in a nutshell, my study is a study of interconnectedness between two different yet very interrelated scholarly spheres, scholarly uh, worlds uh, that came into very, um, yeah, into, into, into very significant contact towards the end of the 19th century. Um, but um, this relates to why we're doing this research, um, because um, in a sense, this research that we're presenting in this um, lecture lies at the intersection of my research interest on the form and function of scholarly networks forming around Oriental studies, especially during the colonial period, with Ruqayya's research, which heavily features the biography of a particular very significant um, Orientalist scholar, Christian Snooker who played a significant role in the early audiovisual study of Islam with his ideas about ethnographic photography and uh, the usage of sound recordings in the systematic study of Islam. Uh, so it is no wonder that we meet around the figure of Ignaz Goldseer for one significant reason, that his enormous archival bequest, or naslas, serves as a gold mine of primary sources for both of us. Uh, for both of our research topics. Approached in a horizontal way, the massive distribution of the Goldseer correspondence over time and over space helps the accurate drawing of the network of Orientalism until the end of the First World War, illustrating the disciplinary connections both inside Europe and the Muslim world and, and towards the Muslim world. Yes, and on the other hand, the potential of approaching the bequest of Goldseer in a vertical or in-depth way is best, is best illustrated in the study of the plentiful correspondences between Goldseer and also Snooker Gronje. Spanning between 1883, when their correspondence started, um, until Goldseer's death in 1921, there are, there, um, are 438 letters that document a very passionate and fruitful relationship between these two of the most prominent scholars of Oriental studies um, that may, in, in the period that may actually be called the golden age of the discipline. These letters um, shed, a, on, shed light on, a pers on personal concerns, professional experiences, and collaboration, collaborations that explain a magnitude of aspects of the life and work of Christian Snukogronje, who is still a very contested yet foundational figure in Arabic and Islamic studies in the Low Countries and in Europe as a whole. So in this presentation, um, we aim to illustrate how the censuses of biographical sources with primary sources from large caches of correspondence, such as the Goldseer Nachlas, opens up new avenues for the historization of the development of both research projects and research networks or scholarly networks. Most of this effort is deeply rooted in possibilities that were only afforded to us as researchers due to the digital nature of these sources that we use and the digital context in which we conduct this research. Accordingly, uh, this effort is shaped by the digital availability of the sources and is concerned with making the results emerging from this research also digitally available and in a sense, yeah, um, digitally compatible. And we will talk about this uh, in more detail towards the end of our presentation. Yes, yeah, so one of the leading questions that both of our research is driven by is how did Islam Wissenschaft or the study of Islam unfold in the early 20th century. And we want to approach this by this case study of Goldseer's, uh, Goldseer's work, known uh, as al um, but it's also Fadai al Um And we use the, the, to approach this and how this came into being, um, we approach, we, we look into the correspondence of Goldseer um, with Snukochronje mainly. Um, essentially, what we're trying to do is creating uh, a window into the backstage of this scholarly production, or if we use the 
cinematic language, we're trying to build a making of of this research project, of this result that Goldseer uh, ended up with that is the book uh, and the edition that he made of this particular manuscript. So in doing so, we will be able to clearly highlight the mediatory role that was played by Goldseer in connecting different communities concerned with the study of Islamic heritage, both in Europe and in the Arab world as well. So accordingly, uh, we show how, to, uh, how this approach enables us to unearth scholarly contributions that do not usually make it to the final form of research work, that do not make it to you know, uh, the front stage uh, of research results. Um, at this stage, we turn to Goldseer's memoirs or the Tagebuch to establish Goldseer's involvement in three distinct scholarly communities that engaged in the systematic study of the Arabic and Islamic culture. Each of these communities uh, is linked to a study trip that Goldseer conducted beyond, uh, at one point in his life beyond his uh, native Austria-Hungary. The first community is the community of the German um, Orient and Islam Wissenschaft uh, of the late 19th century. And in this Goldseer's membership into this community um, emerged throughout his time doing his uh, postgraduate studies on a scholarship from uh, the Hungarian government in Berlin and Leipzig between 1868 and 1871. Uh, in this period, Goldseer studied directly under some of the founding figures of the 19th century German Orientalism. Um, we're talking about names such as Pittstein, Haarbrucker, uh, Steinschneider in Berlin, uh, and more importantly, we're talking about Heinrich Fleischer in Leipzig. Um, Fleischer will not only play a fundamental role in Goldseer's um, scholarly development by directing his research interests towards manuscript theology and Islamic history. Uh, but would also eventually become Goldseer's mentor and doctoral father, Dr. Fatter, as they say in German. And um, this very strong connection between Goldseer and Fleischer, uh, who was probably the most important German Orientalist during his lifetime, did not only secure Goldseer a position at the uh, Deutsches Morgenlandische Gesellschafts Journal as an assistant, but also pl placed him, if we use the Islamic terminology, uh, in a senate, a connection, a direct scholarly connection to some very important figures in the history of the Oriental studies uh, in Europe, such as Dusasi, who was the teacher of uh, Filasha himself. Accordingly, this firmly situated Goldseer at the heart of the German scholarly community uh, of Orientalism, or Orient Wissenschaft until the end of his life, which is something very, which is something abundantly clear in Goldseer's uh, preference to conduct much of his work mainly in German. However, um, one of the most significant of Fleischer's many student, uh, many gifts to what many, who many people considered as his favorite student, that is Goldseer, uh, would be Fleischer's arrangement for Goldseer to embark on a semester abroad at Leiden University in 1871, which brings us to the second community. Yes, so the second community is that of the Dutch Arabic and Islamic studies. So the Dutch scholarly community, which was mainly focused in uh, Leiden. As we just mentioned, Goldseer's entry into this community uh, was arranged by Fleischer who recommended him uh, to the two main pillars of the Leiden School in 1871 were De Goeie and Dozy. And uh, during that period uh, that Goldseer stayed in Leiden, he developed a very strong relation with De Goeie, mirroring um, to a large extent his relation to Fleischer, who encouraged him to continue working on manuscripts philology, uh, along with his other students, Ritterhausen and Houtsmar, who became the pillar of the Utrecht School. 
Um, and he also continued working on the history of Islam, uh, which once again echoes the line of study uh, he developed under uh, Fleischer. Uh, this period in the Netherlands left Colsier deeply engaged with, with uh, Dutch Orientalism, or what he called the Leiden School, um, and it uh, laid the ground for his upcoming uh, lifelong friendship uh, with one of the leading figures of uh, yeah, of Dutch Orientalism of the next generation, which is Christian Snukro Gronje. They first met in the 80s, in the early 80s in Leiden in, in the context of the International Congress of Orientalists. And the third community that is of significance to this study um, uh, is closely related to uh, what is often referred to as the Arab Nahda, because we consider it as a an intellectual movement or uh, a thought school, or, or this is a whole different can of forms that uh, we can eventually open later. But um, he, Goldseer came into very close contact with many of the central actors of the Arab Nahda during his so-called Eastern year, which was a year of study abroad again that he conducted between 1873 and 1874 visiting Syria and Egypt uh, and engaging very closely with the local intellectual circles there uh, up to the point of actually studying at Al-Azhar uh, in Cairo. Uh, during this trip, Goldseer came into very close contact uh, with many Arab scholars, such as uh, Jamal al-Din al-Afghani, Saleh al-Ghazi, many members of the very prominent uh, Damascan family of the Shah Bandar, um, but amongst these many figures, uh, the role um, of one particular scholar with whom Goldseer became intimately acquainted uh, in the larger picture of the unfolding of the Arab Mahda has been coming into spot, uh, under the spotlight recently. Sheikh Tahir al-Jazairi, or the walking catalog of Arabic manuscripts as more than one of his contemporary uh, uh, named him, um, has been the subject of an increasing number of studies recently, such as Ahmed Shansi's latest book, um, and his role in setting the Mahda agenda regarding the Arabic and Islamic manuscript, uh, uh, manuscript heritage, has been enormous, yet understated. This, amongst many uh, efforts includes uh, the establishment of the two most important centralized libraries in the Sham or the Levant region. Those are the Zahiriya in Damascus and the Khalidiyya uh, in Jerusalem, which was an effort that effectively put a stop to the bleeding of manuscripts from the fragmented Waqf libraries in the region, the bleeding into the private market. Uh, that happened through by or due to different reasons such as theft such as uh, you know uh, disappearance uh, after study visits to these walk libraries and uh, eventually these manuscripts would find their way into the private market in, in Damascus or in Aleppo and uh, somehow end up in the hands of uh, European um, mediators some of whom were intimately familiar with uh, figures like Carl Landberg and Johann Wittstein, who managed to siphon uh, a, rather, a rather huge number of uh, manuscripts that were acquired in such ways, uh, and that ended up being the core of the huge collections in Berlin and many other places. Um, Sheikh Tahir also played a fundamental role in guiding the curation of two of the most important manuscript collections in Egypt, which would eventually become one of the cores of Dar al Kutub, the Egyptian National Library, namely the collection of Ahmed Basha Taimur and Ahmed Zaki Basha. Uh, and both, and, and when we look at Goldseer's Tagbuch and uh, his Naflas, we find a lot of material that testify to the intimacy of his relationship to this particular figure. Um, 
having laid out the communities we aim to connect uh, with um, our study of goals here, it is appropriate to introduce our choice of case study. Yes. So why, like now first that we had a look at the different networks, why do we want to have, uh, like, I think these, like what we want to say is that the, the, the case study of Razali's work is really showing how these networks kind of cooperate and how they come together. So uh, the case that, um, uh, is that Goldsier's work on editing and introducing the book Fadaih al Bataniya by um, Al Ghazali. So yeah, this this really shows the um, how the network work together. And actually, this is a polemic work by Al Ghazali and also um, known al, uh, as Al Mustazhiri, as we said before, because it was a dedication to the Caliph Al Mustazhir. Um, but it is still for us um, of of big. Uh, important because it prompt, uh, prompts us to con con concentrate on it here um, that because um, it's a product of Goldsier's first edition and it functioned uh, as an arena of international collaboration that connected Damascus, Leiden, London and Budapest to each other. And this collaboration is laid out, laid out in the details for the Goldsier correspondence between 1913 and 1917. My apologies for the confusion. <laughs> so the significance of this book came to our attention while I was reading the introduction of the first complete edition of the same book published in the Arab world in 1964. So almost half a century after the publications of the publication of Gold Sears edition in 1960. By that time, uh, it was believed that Goldseer knew of the existence of only one copy of this of this manuscript that he considered as a unique, and it was this was the case actually. Um, and in in the introduction to this Egyptian edition, the major Egyptian philologist uh, and philosopher Abd Rahman Badawi, who produced this first complete edition, pondered on the reason why Goldseer decided to edit only around a third of the original text of the manuscript, commenting that the British, uh, the British Museum manuscript is rather complete uh, and there was no reason to just work, or since we were doing the work, to only do one third of it. Uh, so trying to answer this question, we resorted to the Goldsea correspondence. And that's because the target booth gave us no clear answer to, as to why. In doing so, we were able to develop a rather detailed biography of how this work actually, or this effort of turning the manuscript into a published edition came into being and how it unfolded. And it was a biography that is not without surprising. Um, so how did it all start? It started by an invitation by uh, the British Orientalist, uh, H.F. Ahmed Oroz, a very difficult name to pronounce, so please pardon me, um, who uh, sent Goldseer uh, a letter uh, on uh, the 2nd of October, 1913, uh, and was clearly asking Goldseer to work on the newly acquired manuscript by the British Museum uh, of Fadaih al Botany or the Mustazhiri. The next letter arrived on the 2nd of January 1914 and contained next to it a complete photographic reproduction of the manuscript. Uh, Whether Goldseer worked on this manuscript between the arrival of these images and the next a uh, letter that he received from Amidros in July 1914 remained a mystery to us. We couldn't answer. The letter was very clearly a reply uh, to a number of questions that Goldseer raised uh, on the provenance and the pagination of the manuscript, which invoked our interest to dig further into the matter. And we came to a very interesting breakthrough in a most unexpected place. 
a short biographical essay in Arabic about Gold Seer that was written by Muhammad Kurd Ali, who is the founder of the Arab Scientific Academy, and eventually he will become the first uh, cultural and educational minister of uh, the Republic of the Kingdom of Syria, an extremely important figure in the history of, um, of in the intellectual history of the Arab world uh, in the early 20th century. And first and foremost, a lifelong student of Sheikh Tahir al Jazair, whom, uh, as we mentioned earlier, was uh, a, a very good acquaintance of uh, Goldsea. Um, in this essay, Kurd Ali mentioned that he met Goldseer in Budapest in February 1914. So just one month after Goldseer received the photographic reproductions of the manuscript. And that Goldseer asked him a number of questions on Al-Ghazali and his work on al Bataniya. Some of which he could not answer, but promised to forward to Sheikh Tahir upon his arrival back to Syria. And upon consulting the gold seer Tagebuch, we were able to confirm that this meeting actually took place on the 9th of February. However, gold seer never mentioned or discussed, uh, never mentioned any discussion of Al Ghazali uh, or Al Fadah al Bataniya or any of this, uh, this work. So we did, what we did next was consult the correspondence, and we could find a letter from Kurd Ali that was dated on the 30th of April, 1914. So two months, uh, uh, no, sorry, less than two months upon, uh, after the meeting in Budapest. And this letter uh, mentions that Kurd Ali is attaching Sheikh Tahir al-Jazairi's answer to Goldseer's questions, which is also available in the uh, Goldseer Nachlas uh, online. Um, and in this most peculiar letter, uh, we find Sheikh Tahir al mentioning the existence of a manuscript that he consulted in Damascus that was missing an ending, which means it's not the manuscript that, is, that was then currently at the um, British Museum. Um, sorry. So none of this was ever mentioned uh, by Goldseer, neither in his Tagebuch, nor in the introduction that he wrote to his edition. This is very important fact of the existence of another manuscript. And the fact that Kurd Ali sent him a letter once again in 1920, more than four years after the publication of uh, the edition, in which he inquired whether Goldseer's work on Fada'ah uh, al has been yet, pub yet, yet to be published, means that, or indicates that Goldseer probably never wrote back in reply to this letter, nor did he inform uh, Kurd Ali or Sheikh Tahir of the publication of his edition. Uqayya? Yes, so that was a little bit of the, the Arabic correspondence on, on how, how this came into being. But we also had a look at the correspondence with Snuko Khranje, so in German, about um, about the Al Mustazhiri um, introduction or the edition uh, of it uh, published by Goldseer. And um, the the first mention of Al Mustazhiri is actually in uh, the summer uh, end of late summer of 1914 um, after. Um, Goldsier had spent uh, his uh, some time uh, in Katzweig, which is um, in the Netherlands on the seaside, uh, with uh, Snuko Hronje and his family. And um, so the first letter that comes after this time spent together is actually um, Snuko Hronje um, encouraging Goldsier to publish something about it. I will read an excerpt which we have translated ourselves. The thought came to me whether eventually the entire text of Al Mustazhiri should be published by you, to which, as, a, as an introduction or in the form of a series of excursions that could connect critical studies to the work, that was, would result into a small book, which either Werner or the Huye Foundation would be glad to publish. Consider this matter with positive results. 
Um, so this is in 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 late 1914, and uh, Goldseer, of course, uh, engages in the work. And in 1915, uh, December 1915, um, uh, Snukogranja receives the first parts. And between 1915, end of 1915, 1916, in April, he uh, gives re revisions of the work, and he's very detailed in it. I have a, like we have added a little sh uh, screenshot of it, like he's saying which pages he would add what, and he gives commentaries on Arabic translations, on passives and active forms, um, and also links it to other works of Al-Ghazali. And until then, uh, then in, in uh, October 1916, uh, we read in a book, your Bataniya book, uh, has by now already been read by many colleagues in the field with great interest. Um, so what we can, you can go to the following slide. Um, it shows us this correspondence does not only show us something about how they collaborated and how the scholarship of Islam was happening, but also a scholarship of Islam in times of war. Um, one of the, the things that um, that Gold's here, uh, sorry, Snook writes at the very beginning uh, is I generally don't read rectoral speeches from world leading countries. If the war still last long, I I won't read anything at all except for Ghazali and Ibn Arabi, and this is what they're working hard on during the First World War. Next slide. Um, also, the, very much reflected in the in this, this the, the the letter exchange is how the community of scholars was militarized by uh, by uh, was separated by militarized borders. Um, for instance, we see that Snook uh, um, is kind of working as an intermediary between Goldseer and Ahmed Nas, who was in London. Um, and he is corresponding, he's, he's forwarding um, messages between them and also on, on for instance, the, the exact size of the, of the manuscript. Um, and uh, oh, yeah, they oh, yeah. are... If I may interrupt, I think it's important that we mention that this was happening because of the censorship caused by Goldseer being based in Austria-Hungary, which was at war with uh, the Entente uh, in uh, United Kingdom or France and so on. So, yeah, the, the correspondence became very physically difficult in a sense. Yeah, yeah. and also physically diff difficult in the sense of how uh, Goldsier would obtain the manuscript, uh, which Gold, uh, how Snoop would obtain the manuscript which Goldsier wrote, and in the end we found um, that he got it via the consul in Vienna, which is uh, written in in the in the Tagebuch. We can go to, to the next. I think we need to hurry up also a little bit. <laughs> um, and of course, we read in between the lines also the the attitudes towards the war and what the scholarly, the scholarly community can mean to that. Snook writes in February 1915, I'm convinced that as soon as this awful illness, the war he's referring to, will be overcome, men of science will be among the first who will feel called upon to heal fractures and to jointly pursue general human aims. Next slide. Um, another really important point that we found also in the in in Snook's commentary on uh, Goldsier's work is that he was um, he was disapproving of the fact that Goldsier would only um, publish a shortened version of Al Mustazhiri of the Al Mustazhiri manuscript, and this is not explained also not in the introduction that was finally published. Um, and Snook insists six times in his letters of the importance to public to, to publish the whole, the full manuscript of it. And then, in, um, yeah, from the mid <clears throat> 1915 onwards, um, he kind of um, <clears throat> does not insist on this anymore. I have also selected a couple of quotes on that. Next slide, which also represent very much how Snook was. Um, I continue, so in uh, November 1914, um, both of them, I continue to find the complete edition of al Fadai uh, as desirable. I'm always uh, uncomfortable with getting to know a book, especially such a small one, only from its excerpts. The reader, for whom the presentation becomes here and there too extensive, may skip what's too much for him, 
I like reading the entirety. One should not mutilate such re relatively small treatises. This doesn't impede also me from having preferred if Ghazali had produced his Ihya to maximum two volumes. And then he continues, I'm not happy about your aversion against the complete publication of al Mustazhiri. I still hope on your conversion to the right path. And what is interesting is, uh, is that actually this is the same critique that he also got from their scholars. I think of this, your turn. Um, okay, so Smoker Cronia's uh, disapproval would eventually prove on point, particularly in the Arab world, uh, where the omission uh, persisted for more than half a century until the publication of the work uh, by uh, Abdurrahman Badawi later on. And uh, um, yeah. Yeah, and so Abdurrahman Badawi will eventually produce the first complete uh, edition of the work uh, in which he will also use um, the, another manuscript discovered later uh, at um, the Qarawiyin collection in Fas, Morocco. And he will also, very interestingly, mention the existence of a manuscript, uh, another manuscript in Damascus, uh, held in a private collection uh, that is missing the ending uh, and not of great use compared to the other uh, two manuscripts that he used to produce this edition, which is extremely interesting and uh, brings us back to the very beginning of uh, the lead that was not uh, fully pulled or followed by uh, Goldstein. And in the present day, uh, we still do not understand why Goldseer decided to make an abridged version of the Fada'ah al Bataniya, especially that it's so small. And this unexplained omission is often utilized uh, by many uh, conservative Arab scholars as a case in point in the wider narrative of an Orientalist conspiracy that is intentionally misrepresenting Islam and Islamic scholarship, in a sense. So, um, in a sense, this, I think we're running out of time, so I will uh, try to run a little bit, and this will lead us to uh, our next point, which is basically uh, the role uh, that of digital scholarship in all this. So, this research was fully conducted uh, in, within a digital environment. And uh, this means that the digital nature of the primary sources has informed to a large degree our approach to its collection, ordering, and analysis. And to this end, I will uh, just uh, stop the screen sharing for a second until, um, or actually change, uh, and share another screen with you. Uh -huh. Yeah, there we go. Uh, okay, so accordingly, we approach the material uh, in this research uh, through the concept of structured linked data, uh, utilizing, first of all, the, the cornerstone of this entire research is how well documented and well cataloged the gold seer Nathlas is by the Hungarian Academy of Science, which enabled us to go through it in a very rapid and meaningful way. Um, so we were able to start ordering the gold seer bequest in a manner that suits our main goal of charting the network of oriental studies uh, in the late colonial period. So in this, to this end, we use this impressive Dutch software, node goat here, open source software. This is a very important point that I'll be touching back on uh, later, which makes it possible to create a data model that enables us to order the gigantic body of information that is the correspondence in an interconnected and systematic manner. So you can see here that we managed to extract uh, the entirety of the 
the persons uh, and uh, who engaged with goals here in correspondence, uh, resulting in 652 um, individuals with whom we all always, um, how to say that, uh, identified uh, using a consistent identifier that enables us to open up uh, the entirety of their published works. So now we have uh, the works of 600, uh, the connection to 683 people who published on one topic or another. And in doing this, we are able to directly connect uh, the entirety uh, of our database uh, to the holdings of all the major library record holders in the world and are able to see exactly what kind of works were published by this individual and how they are connected uh, to different languages and how they are connected to the other authors uh, in different collections. Um, in addition to that, we were able to um, isolate different research projects that are engaged in this that were represented in this correspondence. So, for example, over here, we have the research project of Kitab Fadaih al in which we are able to isolate the different correspondence. This is, of course, done by hand, that discuss the matter and show exactly what they were uh, and record in an organized manner what kind of contents or what kind of topics they were dealing with, as well as isolate the collaborators who worked on this project and be able to follow them in the same connected and consistently identifiable manner. This enables us uh, further possibilities, like for example, being able to produce uh, or engage in a network analysis of how this research project unfolded. Like here, for example, you have a the main actors involved uh, in here, you have Ignaz Kolsir in the middle with his work and how he's connected to the other actors, uh, the other collaborators in the project. And you see that the intensity of communication on the topic with Christian Snukrofronia was much, much more condensed than it was, for example, with Kurd Ali, who was an indirect connection to Tahir al-Jazairi or compared to Ahmed Rose, who was isolated from Goldseer through the First World War. In addition to that, we're also able to you do that. Oh, sorry. Apologies. Uh, over geographical representation to be able to follow the development and intensity of the correspondence in a meaningful way. Here you see the, con the intensity of the connections that brought together uh, Grossi or Budapest to um, Snookrochronia and Leida, uh, uh, and also that to a lesser extent it was with uh, between London and Budapest, between Amidros, and to a much lesser extent between um, Kurt Ali and uh, Tahir al and Damascus. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm very late. I'm really sorry about that. Uh, we re revert back to our slides. I think I will eventually skip the last slide for me uh, about the digital approach in the future. And I leave it to Rukaya to uh, start question, I think. Well, yes, I guess uh, there, there was already a first uh, one in the chat. Okay, let's start maybe with uh, Jonas miller lachmann So thank you very much. Do you plan to add the correspondence metadata to Corp search, Corp search? And will the network visualizations be made accessible publicly. I should add that yes. search, we are going to have a presentation later this month. I don't know. Um, so anyway, so. Uh, sorry for the interruption, but uh, definitely, yes, this is a slide I actually skipped, um, which was basically about uh, the availability and the next steps uh, towards making this, uh, this research data available and in which form. And um, in a nutshell, Yes, it will be made available in the most open and interoperable uh, way possible. That would probably be uh, on, as a text-based uh, data. 
uh, that would be able to be operated on as many different platforms as possible. So hopefully no prioritary software and, the, and eventually the, uh, we also plan to publish uh, the entirety of the two databases that we have been working on. This is one, the, the one uh, of <clears throat> correspondence, which uh, the gold sea correspondence is the core of. And there is another one uh, about the International Orientalist Congress uh, that will also be eventually made available publicly in open source so that other researchers will be able to contribute to it. Yes. Thank you. Um, then another one. Thanks for this wonderful case study. The question on Goldsia scholarly communities, how about the Hungarian scholarly community? And how about looking at the representatives of the science of Judaism in Berlin, as well as Hungary and elsewhere, as yet another scholarly community Goldsia engaged with? This is a really uh, good question. Yes. So I think um, we really approach the community because, you know, <laughs> Goldsia and Snukhone, they are they're giants in the field. So it's very difficult to, to make claims about them and, and their communities and what and their works even. I mean, there's these kind of huge publications. I mean, just from the last two years, you know, like uh, two big books on just Snook. So, I mean, um, making big claims about them and about their community is really difficult. That's why we also decided to approach them from, uh, from the work of, um, of Goldsia al Muslosheri, so of his introduction. So, in, in, in that sense, we haven't encountered the, the importance of these other networks, but of course, it, they are, of course, there, yeah. Okay. And in a sense, I think, oh, sorry. If I may add to that, um, I think what's most important in uh, what we're trying to present is rather the methodology and, and the approach rather than the contents itself. We are, for example, I can speak for myself. I'm not equipped to deal with the Hungarian scholarly community because I do not speak Hungarian. Uh, and my knowledge about um, uh, Jewish scholarship is, is rather very limited. So I'm not equipped to that, but I guess we are trying to offer an approach that would be of use uh, to further research, uh, to other researchers to be mm -hmm. able to follow these uh, leads. Mm -hmm. And I think also approaching such a big scholar as Gols here, or also Snuko um, really invites for collaboration. And that was very nice in, in Kotos and my collaboration that, you know, I can, I mean, I'm German speaking, native German, so I can very easily also read the handwritten works and so on. And Kotos can much better and quicker scan through, through the Arabic network. So I think um, this is really necessary for to, to approach that network. Mm -hmm. Why it's and super important? <laughs> yeah. Sorry. And why it's super important to have the results uh, available in an open and interoperable manner, so that what when others are doing such uh, in the endeavors, they would be able to connect and interlink it with what has already been done. Uh, to enable future researchers to build on top of that rather than reinvent the wheel again. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Uh, so Suha Kutsiya also asked about the um, accessibility of the database, which you already um, mentioned. Uh, then we have a question from Peter Coppens. Uh, thanks a lot for this incredible presentation. I'm really excited about your work. Goldsia translated the work of Tahir al Jazairi on Hadith criticism to German, Tawji al Naza. Are there any indications in your research that Jazairi influenced Goldsia in his ideas on Hadith criticism? First of all, I would like to answer that with a question regarding did you actually manage to find a copy of this translation? Because I scoured the libraries and the internet for one and I couldn't. Peter Coppens, do you want to talk to that? I mean, just unmute yourself. No, I didn't find it, unfortunately. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm theorizing. I, I really have a theory that uh, it's, it doesn't exist, in a sense, because I was only able to find mentions of it in Arabic sources. And uh, I've traced all of them back to the same, um, how to say that, a biographical essay that from Kurd Ali that, we, that I mentioned in this research. 
So figuring out whether this translation actually exists, it would be a new finding for me. So in this regard, I really unfortunately cannot um, talk about indications uh, regarding how Jazairi uh, influenced Golseer on Hadith, but uh, I found rather a number of um, secondary sources that discussed uh, their work in tandem, uh, to, and it would be interesting to actually look into that. I would share these um, these works with you over email, uh, and maybe we can talk about it in, in a bit more. Thank you. Um, for the moment, we, we don't have any more questions on the chat. Um, are there any more questions? Um, if anyone has a question, finds it difficult to type it into the chat, you can also um, raise your hand and you can speak. Um, I was wondering, um, how did you decide on using the, the node goat, goat um, uh, mm -hmm. solution? Uh, can you elaborate more on the question? Maybe well, okay. did you have, did you try other, I mean, did you look into other tools or was this one uh, in particular, what attracted you to using this one uh, that rather than others? There the is, um, yeah, yeah. Th there is a, there is a network of like a group of scholars who work on um, Node Code here uh -huh. at the University of Amsterdam. And then uh, they wanted to invite other scholars to like, to just have a look into that. And we got an invitation and that's also the great thing to be part of a network. So I was like, oh, because Kotos is really more focusing on the network. And then I invited him and another colleague to to participate in that. So that was, I think, the, the first, uh, yeah, just because colleagues were using that. And then it showed out to be a really great platform. And up to that point, I was actually engaged in trying because I'm, I'm as Qayyus said, mainly concerned with the network. I've been engaged in trying to solve this problem using more traditional solutions that is Gephi uh, mm -hmm. to, to be able to do uh, more in-depth network analysis. But what I realized that uh, Gephi offered a rather flat uh, interpretation of a network mm -hmm. that did not enable me to make the connections that I was most interested in. I was able, I was most interested in creating meaningful connections between different bits of data. So I needed more depth in there and I needed to relate different data points of data points of different kind to each other. I needed to relate works to people, to geographical places, to and to time. for all of this to happen over time. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, so unfortunately, like old school network analysis did not work for me. And I would not even categorize NodeGoat as a network analysis solution. Uh, but in a sense, I, I find extremely useful uh, or extremely promising uses for it as a, a, um, a databasing solution that enables exploratory research that would eventually uh, help a researcher do their, yeah, I'll say that, uh, do their analysis rather than do it for them, if, you, if that makes any sense. Yes, it does. Thank you. Uh, we have a comment uh, about this from Jonas uh, müller lachmann uh, suggesting another solution, which is Neo4j. Mm -hmm. Jonas, do you want to talk about it? Just unmute yourself. Jonas? I'm in the train, he can't talk. <laughs> uh, it's a graph database solution. So, Kotos, do you see that? The Neo 4J that he mentioned in the chat, I, I, I can't say anything. I don't know whether you know it. Or... I have encountered the solution before, but it's okay. really, um, I haven't engaged with it. This is something that I should be doing. Okay, good. Um, then we have a comment from Alexander Nagel. Thank you for introducing your fascinating project. Excited about the outcomes. And I'm also curious about the photography aspect of the network. Wonderful program series too. Thank you to the organizers. Thank you. <laughs> Bukaya, do you want to say something about photography? Um, I mean, Golsi, he got photographs of the manuscript, right? And that's why he could actually work on, on, on this. Um, 
in the correspondence between Vulture and Snook, um, I was also trying to find something about like the use of photography or how this was also, um, yeah, like how there could like a kind of new kind of Islamism shaft, which was access like done by Snook on basis of photography and of of also visual material and how this came into being. And I was really like wondering about that. I just know that they uh, because Snooky also um, uh, experimented with phonograph and he did recordings of uh, like voice recordings and, and uh, Raven and Twins. I mean, he commissioned them um, and they were they were talking about this and there is very little letters that are um, uh, that are still existent now, unfortunately, of Goldshear to Snook. And then one of them, uh, Goldshear includes a little, um, yeah, like a note from, from a newspaper on uh, the, the phonograph because he knew that Snook was working on that. But further, um, especially in our case study, there was not so much of uh, like photography didn't, didn't play so much of a role. It would, would have been yeah. nice. <laughs> but If I may add to that, I mean, not directly, but there was something very interesting that um, I was pondering about for a while. Uh, was that in the, in the Goldseer Tagebuch, in the memoirs, Goldseer talks about uh, his special connection with Snooker Pony, and he explains it in the particular context of going to Damascus and living Islam. And he comments and says that uh, in this trip, I formulated uh, a mission that Snook will only, would be able to realize fully 12 years later in his trip to Mecca, in which we study Islam by living it, by experiencing it through our uh, eyes, through, uh, through living through it. And um, I was wondering that Goldsey always goes back to this through, uh, throughout his, his memoirs. And in a sense, the, uh, the Snook Rufonia uh, trip to Mecca was really centralized around the usage of photography, in a sense. So this, in a sense, this experience of Islam, this living of Islam was one way or another conducted through the lens, right? So uh, just not trying to be too po poetic, but uh, just the thought that I had. <laughs> Thank you very yes, much. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Bukaya? Yeah, it's another way, of course, of capturing uh, like a community, right? Um, and uh, I think what is what also plays very much into the photographs that Snook took is also this, this um, like in Mecca, uh, the, the quest for, like you can really see like the race is still in there because in Mecca, of course, there are people from all around the world coming and then he puts them together and oh, these are, are the Uzbeki pil uh, pilgrims and these are the pilgrims from Morocco or, you know, in the classification of pilgrims or of people, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of reflected a little bit in, in this very early photography. Very interesting. Well, thank you both again so much for this wonderful presentation and, and case study and, and also the possibilities of of uh, what's out there in terms of uh, digitally working with this and even getting more out of this material. Um, so with this, we are now coming to the end of today's session and please do stay tuned and in particular take note of the next event in this series, which is Friday, February 10, with a lecture by Ernst Help entitled Leo Strauss Letters to the Arabist Paul Krauss between the search of the hidden truth and exile in Mitzrayim. And please note that this lecture will take place at 9 a.m. Uh, EST because uh, our speaker is based in Hong Kong and so he cannot do the usual noon time at Princeton. So it's 9 a.m. Princeton time or New York time. So please uh, make a note in your calendars. And details and additional information on this series can be found on the links that are also in the chat. Um, and uh, so, so visit either of the, of the different pages or just register for the next one. And we are happy to host you again in a few weeks time. Thank you again, Rukaya and Kotos. And thank, thank you everyone who came.